Stanford University. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the third uh, class in this course on the State of the Union 2014. Uh, this is a big week in education at Stanford. I suppose that's redundant. It's always a big week uh, for education at Stanford. But in particular, not only do we have this uh, terrific panel of people here this evening to discuss the issue of education, but I want to call your attention especially to something that's been cycling up here on the screen. Uh, tomorrow e afternoon and also Thursday afternoon, there will be two lectures in the Tanner Lecture, annual Tanner Lecture series by Danielle Allen, uh, who comes to us from the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. And she's uh, going to talk about uh, the title of her two lectures is Education and Equality, another topic that will concern us directly in this course in a couple of weeks' time. Education and Equality, Two Concepts of Education. Uh, both lectures are at 5.30 in the afternoon. Both are in the Bechtel Conference Center, which is just a stone's throw away from where we're sitting here this evening. Uh, I've known Danielle Allen and worked with her for a number of years. Uh, and I can tell you she is an uncommonly elegant and fresh thinker with the philosopher's knack for cutting through to the essential core of the issue at hand and probing it with great cogency and clarity and originality. Um, I recently looked at her most recent book, which is about the Declaration of Independence, which is a book that I commend to you as well. It's called Our Declaration. And thinking about her connection with Jefferson and her lectures on education this week, I was reminded of a famous statement of Thomas Jefferson's that we might take as the charter for tonight's discussion as well as for Danielle Allen's lectures in the remainder of the week. He said, <clears throat> if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. If we are to guard against ignorance and remain free, it is the responsibility of every American to be informed. Well, that's part of the reason why we're offering this course, and uh, we take our hats off to all of you, and thank you and commend you for your interest in being here to get better informed about various matters that concern the health of this republic. And tonight our topic is education, and Rob Reach is going to lead us off. Just a quick addendum to what David Kennedy mentioned about Danielle Allen. I spent uh, uh, 18 months recently co-editing a book with Danielle that came out last year under the title Education, Justice, and Democracy, some of which, um, some of the material in which you'll hear if you attend the lectures. And uh, the impression that David gave of you is the same impression I have. She's really a fantastic, intellectual, great uh, presence uh, as well in the, in the classroom. And if you can make it tomorrow or Thursday, it'd be fantastic. All right, so uh, I have a special interest in the topic of education. So as David Kennedy did last week when we considered the state of California, I wanted to take just a few moments to give a set of framing observations about education for our discussion on stage today. About 20, 25 years ago when I was graduating from college, a new organization had just been created that I learned about. It was called Teach for America. And inspired by the civic mission of Teach for America to make public education the civil rights struggle for the generation of college students. Uh, I was attracted by its mission, uh, applied shortly after graduating, was accepted, and was sent off to Houston, Texas, where I taught sixth grade for two years at Rusk Elementary School. Sixth grade was the top grade of the elementary school there, and I had completely embraced the civic mission of TFA, and I agree then, as I agree now, with TFA's mission or motto, which is that every child deserves the opportunity to attain an excellent education. While I was at Rusk Elementary School, I was thrown unsuspecting into the front lines of school reform battles because after my very first year of teaching, which as anyone who has been a school teacher knows is among the most difficult professional tasks one can undertake, Rusk found itself thrust into the center of school reform because it was one of the first schools in the country that was reconstituted, which was a kind of novel school intervention, which meant the entire school's staff, from the principal down to the janitors, 
were fired. They were guaranteed um, jobs within the Houston district, but no one was entitled to return to the school in the following year. A new principal was hired, and I was one of maybe three or four faculty who then remained at Rusk in the second year. I have to confess something personal now. I had an enormous um, challenge when I was a teacher, wanted very much to stay in education, but as a non-Houston uh, native, um, I really did not find myself enjoying living in Houston and began to look elsewhere in the country. And I found myself applying to graduate school and I arrived here in 1994 at the Stanford School of Education to study uh, in the PhD program. And probably within the first three days of arriving on campus in 1994, I picked up an article by a professor whose name I did not know at the time. Her name was Linda Darling Hammond, who's with us tonight. The article was a broadside against TH for America, which said that it was an active injustice to children in um, urban schools, and that the best case scenario would be that TFA should more or less shut down tomorrow. <laughs> Gave me something to think about. I had what was a very productive problem then as a graduate student, and it's been really one of the reasons I've continued thinking about and writing about education for the past 20 years. So I want to start with just four brief observations about public education, which put the entire context of contemporary school reform questions and battles into, I think, a broader historical frame. So the first is something that I think is uh, not as appreciated as it ought to be by ordinary folks who um, participate in public schools in some way, whether as teachers, students, parents who send their kids to the schools, and in fact by school reform um, debaters, which is that the idea, the very idea that a government should take responsibility to provide at public expense an education for children and then to couple that free opportunity for an education with compulsory attendance laws is roughly speaking only 100 years old in the United States. The advent of freely provided schools dates back into the 19th century, but the addition of compulsory attendance laws is a, is a feature that really came alive in states in the 1910s and 1920s. So it's an experiment and really a kind of wondrous feature of democratic states that they undertake to provide universal education at no expense to any child in the country. Second observation, the complaint that you sometimes hear about school reform, often in newspapers or on television or in magazines, is that school reform has been hyper-politicized. We hear people weighing in on either side of, of, the, of the political spectrum about what ought to happen or what ought not to happen, and that it would be much better if education, which everyone universally agrees ought to be provided, were not as politicized as it currently is. However, it's um, apropos that David Kennedy mentioned Thomas Jefferson, all the way back from the founding era of the country, the founders, in particular Thomas Jefferson, had in mind a system of public education that was intended to be political. Thomas Jefferson, you may know, if you go to visit Monticello and see his grave, there are three accomplishments that Jefferson chose to list on his gravesite. The first is that he's the author of the Declaration. The second is that he's the author of the Bill for Religious Liberty or Freedom in Virginia. And the third is that he's the founder of the University of Virginia. Notably, he did not include being the third president of the United States. Something that's in keeping with his view about the importance of education, first of all, the, the institution of the University of Virginia, is the perhaps lesser known fact that he had for many years in the Virginia legislature proposed bills that would require the state of Virginia to provide public schooling to children in Virginia. And he had in mind a very decentralized system for it. There would be small municipal units which would have democratic governance of the school itself and the school districts if there were to be such, which would be a welcome enticement for adults in the community who naturally would care about the education of their own children to participate in the local democratic governance of their own schools, which would itself be then a mechanism for active citizenship. Not merely would the schools, as David's quote from Jefferson suggested, be important preparation for children to learn something about what the tasks of citizenship required, but the school design and governance itself would facilitate adult civic participation as well. 
So from the beginning, it was intended to be a political undertaking. Adults in local communities would participate in local school boards and try to figure out what they wanted most for their children. And we got a massively decentralized system, although Jefferson's plan was never adopted, something like the design did come to pass in the United States. And so, of course, we have famously, for some infamously, one of the most decentralized systems of schools provision in the entire world. Um, in California, I don't know the figure, I could gesture over here because I'm sure someone would know, there are many, many hundreds of school districts across the states, many, many thousands of school districts, all with this local governance feature. Think by contrast to France, where there's a single system of education, highly centralized, and I'm not sure whether the following is actually true, but if it's not true, the spirit of it is certainly correct, and it ought to be true for the sake of a, a, a nice quip about France. The French education minister uh, is rumored to have said, when asked in a press conference, um, if you tell me the day of the year and the time of the day, I can tell you what every single French school child is doing across the country. <laughs> That's not true between Palo Alto and Menlo Park, much less the entire country. Massive decentralization and a tight connection with democracy, which leads to my third observation. Um, in a democratic system, there's one troubling feature about how we think about the education of children, which is that children are not permitted to vote. The very beings we claim to be organized a system for are formally disenfranchised from the process of expressing their interests in the system. Their interests need to be represented by other people, by their parents, by their teachers, by experts, by corporations, by, by unions, by principals. Lots of people weigh in to represent the interests of other children, and the children themselves don't. Now, um, to reflect how significant this is, a design feature of our system, I want you to just imagine for yourself the following, and I'll show you a slide um, in just a moment with this. Think to yourself the sum total of federal, state, and local spending that goes for adults over the age of 65 and that goes for children under the age of 18. Just try to fix in your head what the number is for a minute. Here's the answer. Sum total of federal, local, and state spending for people over 65, $26,000. For children, only 11000 that's not the product of a technocratic expert design about how to allocate funds. That's the product of democratic governance in which people vote their interests and in where children, because they are disenfranchised, have to be represented by other people to, rep to show their interest in the system. Which leads to my fourth and final observation. In many times in which you hear people talk about school reform, you'll often hear invocations of how important it is to put children first, to think about the students. And we have this romantic vision that somehow, if only all the adults in the room who were concerned with education put aside their self-interest and altruistically elevated the perspective of the child to the only thing they cared about, miraculously, everything would be better. Now, the political scientist in me as a result of my previous comment about democratic governance and who gets to vote, wants to approach any romantic invocation of the child's interest and if we could set aside our own partisan squabbles and just think of the ch children as nothing more than romance and that essentially you should, and whenever you hear that, take that with a massive grain of salt or even, even better or worse as the case may be, be skeptical. Adults will sometimes represent the independent interests of child, but also, expectedly and intentionally, partly represent their own interests. Parents may vote for things that benefit them more than the school children. Senior citizens may vote for things that benefit them more than school children. Same with corporations, same with unions, and on down the line. We should expect that, not a bug in the, in the system of democratic governance, but an intended design feature. So, this leads me to my final observation. You may not know who this guy is. His name is Terrell Bell, and he was the Secretary of Education under Ronald Reagan between 1981 and 1985. Uh, you may remember, if you um, pay attention to school reform, that the Federal Department of Education was initially created by Jimmy Carter in the 1970s, late 1970s, and Ronald Reagan campaigned on a platform 
including, among other things, abolishing the Federal Department of Education. However, when he got into office, he appointed this man, Terrell Bell, to um, the position of Secretary of Education. Terrell Bell was raised in Idaho. He was one of eight siblings, a single mother, kind of an improbable type in certain ways to rise to this level. And one of the first things that he did when he assumed the office was appoint a blue ribbon commission, something that happens quite frequently in Washington, blue ribbon panel to study education. It was called the National Commission on Excellence in Education. And in 1983, it concluded its duties and issued a report called A Nation at Risk. A Nation at Risk, I want to suggest to you, is the intellectual foundation of the contemporary school reform movement. It is where a lot of the current buzzwords and trends and indeed school reform efforts, you can trace them back to elements in the Nation at Risk report. It had an arresting preface in which the author said the following. If an unfriendly power, foreign power, had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we would consider it an act of war. As it stands, we've let it happen to ourselves. We have, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking, unilateral educational disarmament." Unquote. Now, you can hear the language of the Cold War there very clearly. Notice, however, no language about citizenship. Nation at Risk included a whole host of recommendations, boosting graduation requirements, establishing learning standards, outcomes, measure student learning according to these standards, measure student, uh, excuse me, teacher and school effectiveness, experiment with merit pay, hold schools accountable, encourage experimentation. And I think this report is the foundation of the current moment in school reform in which we talk about no child left behind, the common core, um, competition among schools, student performance, teacher performance, value added measures. And it reflects, I want to conclude, by saying that Americans have long had an unrivaled faith in the power of the schoolhouse, and in particular, the power of the individual teacher to rise above any social challenge and to make the schoolhouse the cure for any social ill. Think of the movies that came out in the 1980s that reflect this view, Stand and Deliver, um, Dangerous Minds, and we have the heroic single school teacher overcoming every possible obstacle. That may well be romance, but it reflects this long-standing faith of um, American citizens in the power of the schoolhouse to solve all ills, including the ills of poverty, including the ills of inequality. If you think for a moment of the motto of KIPP, the largest network, I believe, of charter schools in the country, perhaps the most successful as well, KIPP stands for Knowledge is Power Program. Their motto is no excuses. They can get incredible student performance no matter what the background conditions of the students, the community, the country, it's meant to be the teacher and the school culture that will rise above all, reflecting this long secular faith. So when we talk about school reform today, I hope to set up a conversation in which we discuss it within the context of the broadest array of social problems and whether or not this long-standing faith in the power of an individual teacher and of an individual school democratically governed where students themselves can't vote is really worth that faith. Over to you, Jim. Okay. So we have a really, really great uh, group of folks here tonight. And, and it's hard. Every week we have this extraordinary panel. I say I'm a, as excited about this group as I could possibly to, to be a season ticket holder of the Giants and to give up my tickets for tonight because these guys are such an incredible uh, uh, panel. So I'm going to start uh, on my right, your left, introducing three folks, and then we're going to have Linda and then Checker, and then Randy do their opening two-minute State of the Union, and then we'll uh, go into the discussion. I, I just wanted to, to Rob's point, I would say this. I spend my, day, my days do, as an advocate for kids in education, so I actually do believe that kids in education need to be the number one priority in this society, and that adults like those of us here in the audience or on the stage need to make that uh, an absolute critical choice and, and, and convince the rest of this society to, to come into line with us on some of these. And actually tonight, this is quite an honor because A, you have five extraordinary educators here and advocates as well. So you have great teachers, educators, and advocates, and this is quite a panel. On my right and on your left is Linda Darling-Hammond, who by all uh, accounts is one of the most important and influential experts on education policy in the United States. Like all of us, a, a teacher here at Stanford, but also a former classroom teacher, Linda has uh, had more impact 
on issues related to equity and access than almost anyone I know in this country. She's an incredible advocate for a number of issues. It is our honor to have her here, and we are so lucky at Stanford University to have had Linda on the faculty for 20 years. So she, uh, she will lead us off with, with her comment. Next to her is Chester E. Finn, Jr., better known, and you can call him this too, Checker, as he is known to everyone in the world of education, who's also one of, of, one of the most influential thinkers in issues related to education and education policy in this country, since he was appointed by Terrell Bell, probably, to the Bill rate. Bennett. Okay, Bill Bennett. Bill Bennett to the uh, Department of Education uh, in the Reagan administration in 1985. And in addition to being a leading scholar and running a think tank at Fordham, uh, in, in, he is also a senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution and ha has some of the most thoughtful and provocative views on the state of education uh, in this country and will be a fabulous uh, discussant with our, with our panelists tonight. And next to uh, Checker is Randy Weingarten, who is, foreign, is an ex-teacher also, an ex-New York school teacher like myself, and, and also the most important uh, teachers union leader in the United States. And perhaps the person who in, in, has, the, has an opportunity to improve the quality of teaching in this country and also lead teachers into 21st century classrooms and education. An impassioned and incredibly effective advocate for a lot of the issues that we all care about here. And someone who affects everything from the quality of teaching in the classroom to the politics of education at the state and national level. It should be a great discussion. Linda gets to kick it off. Two minutes, State of the Union, and then it will be a free-for-all discussion, as always. So, Linda Darling-Hammond. Um, I guess I'll start uh, talking about the State of the Union by noting that um, while I started off as a classroom teacher on the East Coast also in New Jersey, Camden, I quickly realized that policy had a lot to do with the conditions under which teachers can do their work. And to uh, Rob's question about is it the individual teacher, uh, anyone who spends any time in the education system knows that there are many, many forces uh, beyond the uh, schoolhouse itself that make uh, the conditions under which teachers and kids try to work and teach and learn together um, different from one school to another. I would point to three things that are huge challenges in the state of education in this union today. Uh, inequality, high stakes testing, and teacher bashing. And I'll say a word about each of those and what I think we need to do about them. Uh, in terms of inequality, we are the most unequal educational system in the industrialized world in terms of funding. And we layer that inequality on top of a system that has become more segregated racially and economically, and in which there are huge income disparities in the country. So uh, the graph that you saw with $11,000 per child as the uh, average allocation uh, actually plays out so that some students in public schools have as little as $5,000 spent on them, and others have more than $30,000 spent on them per pupil in districts across the country. Uh, other countries that have surpassed us in recent years spend their money equitably and usually add money for education of students who are of high needs or low income. Uh, we often spend uh, the most on the more affluent students and uh, in California and many other states, uh, less than the average on students of color and low-income students in schools who then cannot get the kinds of jobs needed and pay the wages needed to afford the Social Security and health care benefits that all the rest of us would like for them to be able to support for us. Uh, that's a huge issue. It's partly the result of the fact that we had a local system from the beginning, and it was our passion for education as American people that led to this decentralized system that hasn't been brought into the 21st century. The second issue is that in the effort to reform schools in the early uh, 2000s, uh, we doubled down on more and more testing. We test more frequently uh, than any other country in the world. Uh, and we, unlike other countries, almost use exclusively multiple choice tests. Pick one answer out of five, which don't resemble anything that anyone actually has to do in the world in the 21st century that has to do with problem solving, finding resources, using them, critical thinking, uh, and all the other things that we really do in the world. That, because it's been tied to high stakes and consequences and sanctions for schools, has driven the curriculum, particularly 
in uh, lower achieving schools to be just a test prep curriculum. And while creativity has been the American uh, selling point in the world, it's been our strength, uh, we threaten uh, to undermine our biggest strength uh, by, by making that kind of testing in the way that we're doing it the be all and end all of education reform. And the final thing that's happened is that we have uh, really uh, undervalued the teaching profession, uh, and both in terms of how we pay for teachers, salaries and status and compensation and those things, uh, but also in terms of how we invest in the knowledge base of teachers, uh, their capacity to do this very hard work well. And we've had in the last few years uh, a growing amount of teacher bashing, which is making teaching a less attractive profession, increasing um, a turnover, and none of those things will allow us to become uh, a leading education nation again. What we need to do, like some other countries and the state of California is beginning to do, is really redesign our investment system so that it is equitable and the dollars follow student needs so every kid will be a productive citizen and make it affordable for all the rest of us to survive in this society. Uh, we need to rethink the way we uh, organize curriculum and assessment so that it's pointed at 21st century skills in the right ways, and we need to build a strong and well-respected profession of teaching and educators uh, so that all of our best and brightest want to come into education and stay there for a career. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Checker, you're up. Thanks much for including me this evening. I also taught in an Eastern public school, also moved into the world of policy. Uh, <laughs> Rob found himself at the side of Professor Linda Darling-Hammond. I found myself at the side of Professor Daniel Patrick Moynihan and uh, have been working on education <laughs> policy issues for the better part of 40 years. Why do you stick with something this long? Uh, partly because it's important and it needs to be stuck with for the good of the country. Partly because it's not all bad news. Uh, we have made, I think, in the last 30 years two enormous um, breakthroughs uh, in American education. Um, one of them is we do no longer judge schools by how much goes into them or what their intentions are, but by whether the kids in them are learning anything. Uh, we are judging schools by their results, not by their intentions or their inputs. This is a huge shift and a very important one, I think. We also no longer take for granted that you have to go to the nearest school to your house. You can if you want to, uh, but the principle of education choice has been pretty well established across most of the United States. Uh, other district schools, charter schools, some places private schools, virtual schools, uh, right on down the list. You don't have to change, but you are no longer compelled to go to a school that you don't want to go to. Not all the choices are as good as they ought to be, uh, and not all kids have choices. Uh, but this is another enormous shift from the, uh, the public schools of Dayton, Ohio in the 1950s where I was a kid. Uh, these are good things, and these do represent the, 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 the proposition that uh, education change, education reform is not a hopeless undertaking. That said, we've got a long way to go. I'm working uh, over at Hoover now on a book that involves international comparisons, uh, and I am struck by the fact that uh, look at international comparison after international comparison, United States is basically flat while a lot of other countries are rising. We're not getting worse, but we're not getting better, and they are. Uh, and uh, this is um, big countries and little countries, Asian countries and European countries, um, centralized countries and decentralized countries. I've discovered that a lot of countries that I thought were centralized, by the way, are not. Uh, you'd be amazed how decentralized the education system of Switzerland is, for example. Uh, and Japan, too, uh, when you look closely at it, but that's another topic. Uh, we've got countries eating our lunch uh, educationally. We've got huge gaps at home in terms of academic achievement. We've got uh, serious neglect of uh, high, high ability or gifted students, even as we also have serious problems with uh, uh, poor and minority and low achieving kids. Uh, and, and, and pulling them up to a level. Uh, we also uh, have an enormous fraction of the population that doesn't think there's a problem. Uh, call it the complacency gap, if you will, uh, or the discontent gap. 
Uh, most of the great American middle class thinks their kid's school is just fine the way it is. And their kid is basically getting a good education because it's pretty much like the education they got a while back. And um, the school looks the same and the teacher's nice. And so things are fine. And those troubled schools that are pulling down the scores are on the other side of town. They're somebody else's school, not mine. So we've got, a, I think, a complacency problem that goes into the politics of this. And we've got the politicization problem. So we need to make a bunch of changes. I think we'll be talking about several of them in the course of the next hour or so. Um, and I think, I think we've got it in our um, capacity as a country to make them. Uh, we've made big ones, such as the ones I described. Uh, and we need not to be complacent and not to give up. Uh, but I think to redouble our efforts to uh, make things better. Thank you. Randy? So um, this is what happens when you go last when you do your two <laughs> minutes. You're like thinking, racing, oh my god, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Um, so um, I, the most important job that I've ever had in my life in terms of a sense of um, worldview was teaching 11th graders and 12th graders at Clara Barton High School in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And to the point that was made earlier, what differentiates American public education from virtually anywhere else in the world is the commitment to universal access and universal attainment. And I learned more than at anything else I've ever done that when you put in and have the investment and the support Linda was talking about and have all the time and a lot of resources, virtually every single child can achieve his or her dreams and his or her God-given potential. And I saw that with my kids over and over again in terms of the work that we did. Not my work individually, but the work we did together as a team of teachers helping our kids meet and beat kids in Scarsdale, New York, and other places on competitions on the Bill of Rights. And that, in some ways, is the same ideology as Teach for America, but in a very, very different way. Because what I see right now is a system in a state of flux. We believe in public education, at least many of us in the country. And frankly, and this is where I diverge from Checker, basically, parents and communities throughout the country want great neighborhood public schools with lots of different options like career tech options and other kinds of options. But they want as their first choice a great neighborhood public school. They love their teachers. They want teachers to have more flexibility and more autonomy. And they hate all the budget cuts and the top down um, on high regulations that have come, including all the testing. The flip side is the elite of the country believe in this testing, believe in the kind of competition and privatization, and in some ways, this deprofessionalization that Teach for America, no matter how noble it was, actually brought to schooling, because it's pretty much the only profession these days where you think that somebody is better the less experience they have. Think about that. So you have this dissonance between the elite in the country and people who are closest to kids in classrooms. And in some ways, you also saw it with the chart between what we say about education, about how important it is, and what we spend on education. And so I'll leave you with two thoughts, which is this. You see this dissonance reflected in the statistics about education. 
If you knew that two-thirds of a problem was created by some issue, and 7% of a problem was created by another issue, if you were a policymaker, which would you attack? The two-thirds or the 7%? If you knew that the way in which you could work, that teachers work best, was collaborative or being collaborative and sharing and wanting to actually work with each other, or being individually um, rated and assigned, which way would you have your accountability system? The way in which teachers work best, or the way in which they worked less best? <laughs> which way? <laughs> OK. So our dilemma in public education are all the things that Linda talked about in terms of inequity and segregation and all this other stuff. But the way in which we're trying to solve things is we're focused on the 7%, which is the impact that individual teachers may have on student achievement, not the two-thirds, which is all the social economic issues. And we're focused using a kind of sanctioning and testing and punishing as opposed to helping create the capacity and doing things collaboratively. And that's where you see the big shouting and craziness and polarization. Because teachers are saying, wait a second, I want to help kids. Give me the investment, the tools, the time, the trust we need. And the places that actually do things collaboratively are the places that work best. But we don't sustain and scale up. So there's a lot of things that are actually happening, interesting good things that are happening. But if we don't actually align policy with what we know works and doesn't work, and with what is going on in terms of social immobility and the social economic issues in our country, then we're never going to move forward to the universal access and attainment that we all want for all kids, so that they are the critical thinkers, the creative problem solvers, the kids who understand and deal with and have resilience and persistence, and know and have the kind of relationships they need to have to actually not just experience the joy of learning, but be the people who take care of all of us when we are in that category of elderly but seriously, the people who take care of our country going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. I have a question about teachers. Linda, you called that out as a particular issue that the public uh, focuses on, teacher bashing. You represent, Randy, more than a million teachers. So I expect both of you have views on this. But there, there's an historical argument that the uh, elementary and uh, secondary K-12 educational system for generations was parasitic on, or put a little more charitably, was the incidental beneficiary of the fact that women had very few career opportunities other than teaching. So that a lot of talented women for generations from the late 19th or mid 19th century on into the mid 20th century, very talented women were attracted to the teaching profession because they didn't have any choices and that something happened in the post-World War II era that opened up other opportunities for women, and the educational system as a whole hasn't recognized that, and so we now recruit teachers from a much less talented and gifted pool of our people. I, I've read things, I don't know, I ask you for, about the accuracy of them, that uh, we now recruit our elementary school teachers from the bottom quarter of college graduates measured in terms of their college accomplishment. I don't know if that's true or not, so I'll put it to you as a question. But the, the, the larger question is uh, how, why have we not recognized this demographic shift in who can take an interest in the teaching profession and done more to recruit more talented people? I'll kick it off and I'm sure others will wanna. Uh, 
In uh, international assessments, if we look across the, the world, in the highest achieving countries, typically teachers are paid about the same as other college graduates. In the United States, teachers are paid on average 60% of what other college graduates are paid. Um, that makes it hard to recruit from the top tier. And as you say, we uh, were the beneficiaries of the, um, what was often called the captive labor market, the fact that other occupations were closed to women. Uh, and I was in kind of that last cohort of people for whom, um, you know, uh, uh, high ability women would choose that as one of a few occupations that were open. Um, and why we haven't changed is a really interesting question because the other thing you see about uh, other countries is that they spend about 70 to 80% of their education budget on teachers and we spend about 50% of our education budget on teachers and we spend a lot of money on people who look over the shoulder of teachers and try to tell them what to do. Uh, and that's a kind of a remnant of the factory model and a sort of bureaucratized way of doing business that uh, for many, many generations uh, sought to deprofessionalize the work of teaching and make it more like an assembly line. Uh, now, it is um, true that there are big differences across states. Some states have very high standards for teachers and very high salaries relative to others. Most of those states are in New England. Some states have you know, lower uh, salaries and lower standards and let people come into teaching with less training and all the rest of it. And by the way, achievement often tracks that if you look across the states. Uh, so the investments are very different, but we uh, have a long-standing problem around the way in which we consider um, the work of teaching and whether we want to um, invest in it to be, you know, the kind of profession that it needs to be to uh, continuously attract in all places the kind of talent that we need to have. So I'll, I'll do a quick anecdote that goes to your point. But um, let me just say, there's two new books that are out. Um, one by Dana Goldstein called The Teacher Wars, um, which I would um, just, I would endorse wholeheartedly reading, reading, reading if you're interested in the history of this. And the other book is one that Bob Herbert just wrote that's just out this week called The Plot Against Public Education. They both get to some of the same conclusions here. Um, but Dana's book, interestingly tracks this and, and shows that before the turn of the century, before the turn of the 19th century, sorry, teaching was a male-dominated profession. And there was, an, um, there was a very intentional um, change of heart by elites and policymakers and foundations to make it a female profession so that they could cut the costs of education and pay people far less um, and, be, and get to this point. And you, and you know, read the book because it's interesting in terms of then all of a sudden the demonization of men and men are not appropriate for kids and small kids and what are men going to do. And so you'll see that in the, but you know, people are, so I, I do think for years, we were, um, we actually um, were, got the benefit of two things. African American women, in particular in urban settings, and women in general. And you see that in some places like District of Columbia, New Orleans, um, teaching became, it, you know, you remember the normal schools and things like that, but teaching became one of the few avenues for African Americans to get into the middle class. And, you're, and, and that was a really important um, role in community as well. Because what you then saw in many schools is that when you saw people from community and you saw diversity and you saw career ladders in this kind of way, it had a virtuous effect in terms of the community and creating a more shared, prosperous middle class. So that was something you also saw in terms of the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. What we saw a lot at the beginning of the 80s was exactly what you just said. 
And you saw in lots of large urban systems, huge numbers of uncertified teachers. And this is the vignette I wanted to say. We used to tease that in New York City, all you had to do is pass the breath test. And because there was a sense of every classroom had to be filled, and who was going to fill them? because it was more important to make sure the classrooms were filled. To Checker's point about learning was secondary to custodial care. And the issue that Linda just raised, which the countries that outcompete us understood, is that if you don't make this a profession that people care about and want to come in, go into, why would people do it? It is an incredibly hard job. And what we saw, in the contract that we negotiated with Michael Bloomberg in 2002 was we negotiated a contract that increased starting teacher pay by somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. And we increased everybody else's pay by about 16 percent. So that's a little bit debunking of myths in terms of what we do as a labor union. And so starting teacher's pay went from 31,000 to about 40,000. And that was June 2002. September 2002, we went from 17% of our staff in New York City who were uncertified to 2%. In three months, just with a 25% increase. Because what else happened? It wasn't that you know all of a sudden people wanted to work for Michael Bloomberg. It was just there was a huge change. And then six months later, when nobody because they were rechanging and reorganizing the system. So um, the new chancellor didn't much care about what was going on in schools. But six months or eight months later, you saw a huge increase in the test scores. The test scores went up that year by six or seven points in literacy and in mathematics. And so the whole notion of pay becomes very important. But the other notion, is what countries that outcompete us do, which is they treat, they give people the tools, the time, the trust to get their jobs done. And the worst thing, if you talk to new teachers, when you're asked to do a job for which you have no support, no control, no authority, and other than the moxie of your own grit, people get really frustrated. And that doesn't happen in the countries that outcompete us. I want to get checker into the conversation, then I, I, I want to. Add I just want to throw too. a couple of facts into the picture. Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry. 50% uh, of the employees of American public schools are not teachers. Yeah. We just did a study of this. I think in I Florida. just said I that. I think Linda right. just said 50 that. 50% are not teachers. Okay. Second fact. Um, there are about 55 million kids in school in the U.S., and there are about 3.7 million teachers in the U.S. Do the long division yourself and ask yourself what is the ratio of kids to teachers. If you do the crude statistics, it's about 14 to 1. Um, when I was a kid in Dayton, Ohio in the 50s, the crude ratio was 27 to 1. If the ratio today were the same as it was then, the average pay of teachers in America would be $100,000. But what we've done with all the huge additions to public education spending of the last 50 years is we've spent it to hire more people to work in our schools, not to hire better ones, not to hire better prepared ones, not to hire smarter ones, not to pay them more. We've hired more people, teachers and non-teachers. The uh, number of teacher aides has gone up faster than the number of teachers. Um, and so I don't think we can realistically, when we are the second highest last time I looked uh, per student spending country in the world on K-12 education, I don't think we can simply say we need to spend more, we need to pay more. We have to think about how many people are we paying it to and what are they doing? Think of a class of, um, pick your number, 18 kids and $10,000 a kid, and it's $180,000 is being spent on that classroom of kids. How much of the 180000 is going to the teacher? Where's the rest of it going? Put a few of these questions in the hopper uh, and uh, ask yourself, why is our education finance system and our HR system as screwed up as it is? Thank you.
Chester, uh, I, I'm long division challenged. You, you gave the Korean ratio, but you left it to us to calculate the U.S. ratio. Can you just tell us what it is, please? It's about 14 to 1, the crude ratio. Oh, I thought you... Uh, that no, was no. A, I, I misunderstood. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, about 14 to 1, okay. if you do the simple long division. There are all sorts of reasons for it, special ed and a bunch of other things. Yeah. And right. the class sizes are about 20... Three twenty-four to one, but correct. Yeah, so and the class sizes that's two hundred and thirty thousand dollars per class. By one, the way, one other interesting fact when and we compare spending in the U.S. and other countries is that uh, in most, uh, in virtually all the countries we would be compared to in the industrialized OECD um, rankings, they have uh, nationalized or other uh, buckets in the society from which they pay health care. Exactly. So about. 20% of the U.S. education budget actually goes to health care for employees who are 80% of the budget. And uh, in other countries, that's paid outside the education budget. So uh, that and food for kids who don't have food at home and a lot of other things mean that we're paying for a lot of things in our schools that other societies pay for routinely in other ways. And if you look at that in terms of, if you look dollar for dollar in terms of healthcare, pensions, which other um, societies pay centrally, as well as food services, we actually um, spend comparably, if not less, per child. Um, and I think that, I mean, but, but Checker, I think you have a, a point in terms of what, are, what has happened in terms of schools. Schools now feed, transport. We um, have the IDEA, which has never been funded um, it's been funded like 40% um, nationally, part. the federal part, um, where we require an individual um, education plan for every special needs student, which I think is a good idea, not a bad idea. But what has happened is, and I just want to go to this, it skews the ratio because the ratio for special needs kids is about six to one or sometimes four to one or sometimes one to one for um, kids. And so what you see is kids in the, um, is other kids, like kids in my classes, you know, we had classes of 33. Um, right now, because of austerity, you have classes in lots of urban settings of 40 kids. And so let's just, I mean, it's just, you know, when you look at these national norm statistics, you see a different picture than when you look at the districts and the kids that frankly, I, I mean, I care about all kids, but I really care about kids um, who are poor. I care about kids who really need public schools. Half the kids in the United States of America who are in public schools are poor. And so we, and, and one of the things that, 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 that we see from the national, the international statistics is when you actually look at, um, I just wanna make sure I have this right. When you look at students in more affluent schools in the US where poverty rates are less than 10%, they actually surpass um, the countries that outcompete us. So this issue of equity, which is an underlying issue that Linda raised earlier, is a huge issue. There's no other countries in the world that actually give kids that need the most the least. They basically equalize funding. And so that's part of the issue we have. We do have even in public schools, two very different school systems, one for middle class to wealthier kids and one for poor kids. I wanna, I wanna stay on the, the topic of teacher pay but introduce a different dimension of the, the question that hasn't come up yet. So David began the conversation around teacher pay by reminding us that there was this captive, captive labor market and um, we could have expected that highly talented women um, found a place to work uh, within the school system and not many other places. And um, I think no one in the room would disagree with the idea that um, boosting teacher compensation would be one way to, to build a talent pool into, into schooling, into the profession of being a teacher. Uh, so I doubt that there's much disagreement, if any, about that particular question in the room. I want to ask, though, about a different feature of the teacher pay system, which, it, which I often hear from students at Stanford, and I myself um, didn't know about when I first became a teacher that I found odd, and I think um, also deserves to be in the conversation when we think about attracting talented people into the profession, which is that there's a, what I think is often called a step 
stepladder system. When you're a first year teacher, you get this salary. When you're a third year teacher, your salary schedule is already set. Uh, when you're a fifth year teacher with a master's degree to add on, your salary is set. You can predict 20 years ahead of time what it is you're going to be making within a school system as a public school teacher, independent of your performance, independent of the, the value you bring to the school. And I think that serves as a, a signal to aspiring teachers that if their performance in the classroom measured in an as yet unspecified way won't be a feature of how they're compensated and that all they have is a salary schedule to look forward to in a step ladder way, that deters highly talented people from entering the profession is my hypothesis. Why is the step ladder system a good feature of the teacher pay system? So frankly, most of us who have negotiated would much rather have a lot more money up front than backloaded. And it's been basically that's the way districts could afford it. Um, and every time, and so the step ladder, the so so the step and and um, and credentialing system was put in place predates collective bargaining, you know, by years and years and years, and it was put in place as a proxy for um, experience and expertise with the sense that with every year that you had experience, you would be better. And there's research that says that that is absolutely true in terms of the first five to 10 years. There's you know, conflicting research in terms of after that. Um, but then it became a matter of fairness of making sure that people would get um, a raise, a predictable raise that they could rely on over the course of time. Um, and the issue about having a master's was that this was a proxy for more skills and knowledge. Now, there's um, a bunch of districts that have actually changed these things. But to your, um, the, the, I think the more important point is that many of us actually believe in having robust evaluation systems that, and that you know, tenure should be earned and that tenure is really about just cause dismissal, meaning that it should not be a uh, teaching should not be a job for life, and tenure should not be a cloak of incompetence or an excuse for managers not to manage. And tenure in K-12 is supposed to be different than higher ed tenure, and it's certainly really different than Supreme Court tenure. It's really supposed to be. <laughs> that before you get fired, there has to be a reason. And it was there, again, it predated collective bargaining because you, know, you had a new school board, the, democrat the democratization you were talking about, and it was kind of like off with your heads. You know, Everybody who was old, go by, because you were in the wrong party or you knew the wrong people. And so this was really about what you knew, not who you knew, and was supposed to be about allowing people to exercise their professional judgment, take risks, this whole situation like in Jefferson County, you know, um, uh, uh, Colorado right now is a good example in terms of the history um, curriculum. But the point is, there has to be an evaluation system there too. It's not su supposed to be you're just sitting there um, not doing anything. And frankly, overwhelmingly, um, most teachers work incredibly, incredibly hard and want that kind of predictability. But there's lots of other things that should be um, pieces of it as well. There should be career ladders. There should be ways to have opportunities to earn more money and still stay in the classroom, do different kinds of things. And frankly, the Baltimore, the new Baltimore contract actually does some of that stuff. Um, there were a lot of contracts that were negotiated in the late 80s, early 90s with peer review and other kinds of um, opportunities that did some of that. Um, but a lot of that was kind of replaced by this refactorization that Linda talked about earlier. So let me, I want to see if we can switch. I want to, I want to see if we can switch some because we're here in the great state of California and at least several of us are permanent residents and you guys are visitors. I want to talk about some quick answers, just a couple of questions. The first one, Linda, is we talked about this, we touched on this last week when we were talking about California politics. Tell us the big, because you, you've been, Linda's very involved also with another Stanford Ed School professor, Mike Kirst, in crafting Jerry Brown's approach 
to reforming education in California, very innovative stuff. So first, to you, Linda, tell us what the big change that the Brown administration made in school finance here and why you think that's a good or not good idea. I, I think I know which, whether you think it's good or not good, <laughs> but tell everybody about it, because yeah. I want to ask a series of questions to you and Checker and Randy about California specifically. I think it'll make some of these issues come alive. I will say a word about that and what's followed it. Okay. Um, there was a uh, video made some years ago that some of you may have seen by John Merrill called From First to Worst, and it kind of tracked California's decline from one of the most um, high-performing education states in the nation in the 70s to one of the lowest achieving as well as one of the lowest spending states over the period of years right. from about 1979 till today. So uh, we're now at a moment where we're kind of doing a U-turn. And I think we're going probably from worst to first. And a lot of states are now looking at what California has done. So one of the most important things was that we stopped the slide in spending that had been a, a result of Proposition 13 and some other um, cuts in the budgets over years. And many of you voted for Proposition 30, and uh, that brought new money into public schools. But instead of putting it back into the old irrational funding formula, which had uh, what Mike Kirst calls the hardening of the categoricals, all kinds of categorical programs that kind of said, you have to spend it this way, and you have to spend it that way, and so on. It's all put in one pot. Uh, all the money goes directly to locals, and it's uh, allocated by uh, a dollar amount per pupil with additional weights for students in poverty, students who are English learners, and students who are in foster care. Which means if you are a district that serves students like that, you'll get more money uh, because of those weights. And if you serve a concentration of such students, you'll get an additional allocation for that concentration because we know that that creates additional needs of the schools. So we will have one of the most progressive uh, formulas for funding and very much like what you see in many other countries. Uh, but by the way, this approach was has been used elsewhere in Massachusetts uh, did this in the early 1990s, and it was one of the things that propelled them to becoming one of the highest achieving states in the country, along with a very thoughtful program of standards, thoughtful assessments, professional development, preschool education, and so on. So we've started down that path, uh, which is um, making a difference already in what's happening in schools. In addition to that, we put in place a local control accountability program, which means that local communities have to be involved in deciding how the money will be used and determining, along with some of the requirements from the state, how there'll be a bunch of measures to see how kids are doing, where the money's going, uh, accountability about the uses of funding. Uh, and it won't just be, what were your scores on the reading and math tests? Uh, in fact, most of the old tests have been uh, ended. Um, California had 35 tests that kids had to take before they got to the SAT, the ACT, the AP, and everything else. Um, about a third of those are remaining, uh, required by federal um, requirements. And uh, new assessments are coming in, uh, tied to common core standards, which are more um, about higher order thinking skills and performance skills. Um, and the range of things that districts will report about will be much greater. Graduation rates, AP uh, passage, college and career readiness, are kids getting suspended or expelled, are they staying in school, graduation rates. So the public will be able to see uh, where the money's going, how kids are doing, and the state can make judgments along with local districts about how to invest in improvements. So Checker, would you agree California's moving in the right direction? You're now living out here, although you're probably going to escape back to Washington soon. Uh, the weather. You is, think we're moving in the right direction with what Linda described? Better. Well, the recipe's right. <laughs> the recipe is right, but you got to be able to cook also. Um, the Massachusetts had a good recipe, and they cooked from it. California has a long history we see on the uh, other coast of good recipes and lousy food. I'm not talking about your, uh, what, what grows in the ground or what's served in your restaurants, which is lovely. Uh, but uh, <laughs> California, for example, long before Common Core, back in the 90s, California established, uh, I, I thought, a pretty good set of academic standards for its schools. Uh, and yet achievement kept going down and down and down because California wasn't putting its standards into operation. Uh, through all the many steps in the education system where something has to work in order for anything to work. 
uh, whether it's from teacher preparation or textbook selection or assessment or accountability or professionalism or uh, uh, financing arrangements, categoricals versus block grants, all and so on. Massachusetts cooked well. Uh, California has a good recipe. Um, I'm sure that Linda and Mike Kirst are expert cooks, but you got a lot of other people in the kitchen. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. So let me, uh, Randy, let me take it another because I want to stay in California a little. So we metaphor. brought up the Common Core. We promised we wouldn't open with a Common Core, but everybody here has some knowledge of the Common Core. Maybe I'll let Rob define it. But Randy, let me ask you a question. In general, on the Common Core, right? Higher standards. Every, the, 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 let's for frame framing it for the audience. Higher standards for achievement for 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 kids using not just, as uh, Linda, I think, mentioned earlier, you know, five question, mul five answer, multiple choice questions, but that are going to teach different forms of learning, greater, greater use of creativity, collaboration, et cetera. The common core in California versus the common core in New York, right? Very tale different. of two states. Uh, tale of, but tell us why. And tell us why, for example, the, the AFT in New York has come out against the way that the Common Core has been rolled out, whereas in California, you think it's been rolled out well. Because people think it's sort of for or against. Right. But this is a critical issue now. So explain to us why you guys came out in general criticizing what happened in New York and saying what was going on in California was good. So we... Um, I really think we should define the Common Core. Yeah, yeah, exactly. define, well then. <laughs> I'm looking at the audience. Okay, and exactly. you a lot of people Linda, going, you define it or Rob define it? I'll say one sentence. Uh, a lot of states got together and uh, tried to see if they could develop common standards in English language arts and mathematics. Uh, and those were developed and then many states adopted them and they really strive to be fewer than the standards that were in place before, higher and deeper. That is, they go for a deeper kind of learning that gets kids involved in problem solving and critical thinking and, and that kind of performance. Okay. So, so New York versus California, why one looks good versus the other? So if you are um, a fourth grader and you're learning mathematics now in fourth grade, under the Common Core, you're not simply memorizing um, division, addition, multiplication, I forgot one. Subtraction. Subtraction. <laughs> thank you. You subtracted it. Um, thank you for that. Um, you are actually trying to do what we learned from Japan, and you're trying to actually think through how you get to um, an answer. And there may be many different avenues. Now, why do I do that? Because most of us didn't learn math that way. And most teachers didn't learn math that way. So the difference between New York and California was California understood that this is a really big transition and that there needs to be, in any transition where you're learning to do things differently, you need to give people time to work together, to try things out, to fail at it, you need to actually talk to parents so that when somebody sees like four different ways to get to the number of, you know, four or 10, that there's not, it's not just, you know, five and five or, you know, it's like so that people then say, oh, I understand what's behind this. And we need to give kids a lot of support, particularly say it's children who are in seventh grade and eighth grade, and they're learning in a different way than they learned in fourth grade. We need to give kids a lot of support. California, do, California doing that. understood that. Okay. New York did not. And what New York did was New York wanted to be first to test. And with the tax cap in New York, so California and New York are going in the opposite direction. California basically got rid of Proposition um, 13. No, it's no. still there. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> That's just wishful thinking. other sources you know. of money. <laughs> All right. Ixnay, never mind. California found different revenue. New York did a property tax cap. California said, let's really work on implementation first. 
and not focus on testing. New York said, we're focused on testing first. California people are not getting the test results reported even when they're going, even when tests are starting to be implemented. So people are starting to look at the data, look at the tests, see what they look like, get a sense of how the whole, um, uh, the, the whole system works together and is aligned together. New York, after the tests were given first time, um, the superintendent declared that the test results would be 30 points below what they were. This was six months before the tests were given. Six months after the tests were given, where there was a gag order on the test, so nobody actually saw the tests. We didn't um, talk to kids about the tests afterwards. It was all kind of like a secret society. Six months later, when the test results were unearthed, what a shocker. They were exactly 30 points lower. So people felt this huge distrust that this was not on the level and this was something that was being done to kids and to teachers to make them look bad as opposed to what the purposes of the Common Core are, which I support, which is how to actually do these, this, this higher, fewer, deeper standards so we can align what kids need to know and be able to do with career and college and life readiness. So Randy, so that basically what you're saying is that it's, the, it's not about the goals of the Common Core. It's not about whether or not the Common Core is a good idea for the society and 46 or 47 states agreed to do this. It's that it was implemented poorly in New York and implemented in, in a much more patient way here in California. Here's the, I, I, I would actually say that that is where the middle is. You're going to have people on the both end extremes. So you'll have a bunch of people who are saying, this is you know, federal intervention right. done to me. Right. And then you have people who actually think that standards are not appropriate. So, but I would say, Jim, that we've gone from teachers really believing that this was the right thing to do with supports and the right thing to do for purpose of, of equity in particular, but they, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, Common Core was implemented in New York worse than the worst, worst aspects of the initial um, healthcare implementation. And it, as a result, created tremendous distrust. And instead of doing the adjustments, New York pretty much said, let's double down on it. Decker, would you agree or disagree? The, quick, we're, we're going to move on to some other topics. So We're only quick. four years in. The Common Core was born in 2010. Nobody has finished implementing it. Nobody except New York and Kentucky have seen the results of any new tests attached to it. Most places don't have textbooks yet that have any plausible relationship. Uh, to what's in these standards. We have no idea what implementation of this thing is really going to entail. Uh, I, I, I think I agree with both Linda and Randy that rushing to judgment before people have had a chance to put this into operation is a mistake. But I also think most people haven't figured out how many things have to change for yeah, a set of new standards in English and math to penetrate into every single public school in 45 states, or maybe this week it's 44. Hey, Rob? Uh, so I'm gonna come back to the, to the broader frame of the conversation we've right. been having about school reform, and in fact, the function of the schoolhouse and society as this place to uh, be the universal solvent for, for social ills. And Randy, I, I, I'm not sure where the data points came from, but, but um, if they're, at least in the spirit, um, um, correct, the, the school performance. Chetty, the, Friedman, and Rokoff. That's the seven percent, two thirds. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Where so, so I was, I was, uh, I was pretty surprised when I saw it. Well, again. and that's so, similar to Hanushek's number, which exactly. is about eight right. percent. Right. And okay. So the, the the teacher explains seven percent, eight percent of school school performance for any child, and two thirds of the performance explained by factors control completely outside of the control of the school. All right. So thinking then as a matter of public policy, 
and how to improve school performance. You said, why are we not paying attention to the two-thirds of the things that, that uh, we think have some predictable effect on school performance? So let's imagine now um, rival policies which involve allocating more money somehow to teacher pay or school system, school finance. Let's call it an additional $5,000 per child um, in, in a state. And then compare it to a $5,000 increase in the earned income tax credit, which would be a significant um, increase in the amount of money that uh, low-income people have, which of course is one of the strongest predictors of school performance. Um, if I forced upon you the binary choice, $5,000 spent in the way you want to spend it within the existing school system, $5,000 to alleviate low-income or to improve the position of low-income people through the earned income tax credit, which one do you go for? So you know I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, but, that, but that's, that's because um, when you, when you um, force a choice between two competing and important priorities, um, it becomes a Hobson's choice. And at the end of the day, even though I raise those numbers about 66% and 7%, we all believe that public education has the potential to be the great equalizer. We're not going to give up on it. And that teaching and learning, great neighborhood public schools that have welcoming, safe environments where we're really working on, on building the teacher core and teacher capacity from preparation um, throughout a teacher's career, where we're really working on rich curriculum, project-based curriculum, and having music and art. And, and, and then doing things like early childhood education, doing things like wraparound services. Right, I would actually argue if you gave us $5,000 more per child in high needs districts, we could figure out how to spend it in a way that was very effective. Um, but I would also argue that we need in this country an industrial policy for good jobs with living wages and one should not be pitted against the other. So the answer is both. Yes. So the answer is both. Absolutely. Can, can I offer a, uh, just a reinforcing fact about the fact that the money could be spent well? Uh, a study came out just a couple of months ago from um, Carabo Jackson and Rucker Johnson is across the bay at Cal, if there are any Cal people in the audience. Uh, I don't usually like to quote, yeah, there's always one, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we got rid of them. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, we'll show you the bridge. We have next we'll week show you the, the head of the UC yeah. system. Oh, my God. Um, they looked at over 40 years in more than 20 states that had done school finance reform. They looked at what happened to kids who were low-income kids who had more than, had about 25% more spent on their education, K-12, uh, over the course of that time. And what they found was that it basically closed the adult gap. Uh, and, and much of the child gap in achievement, in graduation rates, in employment, in you know, uh, reduced poverty, reduced incarceration. Um, and then, of course, that allowed all of those young people to be able to uh, contribute wages and taxes rather than being on the other side of the equation in jail uh, or on welfare. So people did figure out how to spend it. Now, we have other evidence that when you spend that money, in particular, to raise the quality of teaching, and I would say it's not just salaries. It's better, more rigorous preparation. It's you know exactly. uh, making sure that you raise yeah. the standards. You get, as Ron Ferguson found, an even greater leverage mm -hmm. on that. I, I, so I would actually do things like also, you know, how do we do affordable housing? How do we have living wages? I mean, so it's a so it's a bigger issue in terms of dealing with social economic issues. Absolutely, and I didn't mean the question at all in some kind of gotcha spirit. I'm gonna get the mm -hmm. head of the teacher's union to say that she turned down money for, for public education <laughs> and go for the earned income tax credit. I meant to build off the initial, right. initial and rather precise um, you know, specification that two thirds of school performance mm -hmm. is, is determined by out of school factors, which leads me to think that anyone who cares about school reform and the performance of kids ought also be focused on these two-thirds of things that are outside the school. And, of course, the obvious point to make here from the perspective of any policymaker is that budgets aren't unlimited. So we, we have to make choices at the end of the day. They may not be Hobson's choices, but 
we don't have an infinite budget, and so. But you can do, take Cincinnati. Cincinnati is actually wrapped, so it's, it's, Cincinnati is actually wrapped services around schools, and it's cost them only the cost of a Title I coordinator. And they've used, they've done it much more efficiently. And I don't know if Checker's numbers are the same as my numbers here, but if you look at Cincinnati, you're, you see over the course of the last 10 years, the, um, when they've had these health and social services and mental health services and after school services around schools, um, you see uh, um, an increase in the graduation rate from about 51% to about 80 some odd percent, huge decrease in the dropout rate, the achievement rate has gone, the achievement gap has gone way down, and you see um, a huge influx back into public schools. Now, Checker has done a great job in terms of looking at achievement in Ohio's charter schools that have had a um, pretty up and down, um, you know, achievement process. Let's just put it that way. Very mixed. And and the and what's happened is that these public neighborhood schools in Cincinnati with wraparound services have done a lot to mitigate poverty. But just one of the people who have been so amazing doing this work, gotten, you know, has said, I was just at one of the schools, Robert School, which is at the foothills of Appalachia this week, or two weeks ago, and she said the next horizon for them is trying to figure out affordable housing and transportation. Checker, you want to get into this? One of the reasons, I, I once set out to calculate how much of a kid's life does he spend in school? And you'll be staggered by how little of it it is. It turns out to be about 9% of the hours on earth of an 18 year old in America. About 9% of the hours on earth were spent in school. This is one of the reasons that um, the other factors that are not school have a very significant effect on everything about that kid. Uh, not just academic achievement. It's also one of the reasons, incidentally, why wrapping other things around the school uh, is helpful. It's also one of the reasons why, especially for poor kids, they need more than 9%. Um, uh, whether you do it through preschool or longer days or years or virtually or blended or, or flipped or you call it what you like, they need more than 9%. Uh, but let's keep this in mind. The other thing that needs to be said is that the, the, the two-thirds outside of school isn't just things the government pays for. Correct. It's parenting, it's family structure, Absolutely. it's television, it's the cultural stuff. Uh, it's a whole lot of stuff that it's very hard to spend money to fix. So very well said. Here's a, here's a point, a, a comment I want to make. And then David, I want you to bring, since you, so many of us know you as a as an eminent historian and, and, and writer of history textbooks, I want you to comment on Jefferson, Colorado, too, because that, that is a very interesting issue that just came up for us about textbooks. But here's the point I want to make, because it goes to your opening remarks, Rob. See, if, this is a society that spent a trillion or two trillion, I, I, I lost count which, on <laughs> Afghanistan and Iraq in the last decade. And here we are arguing about whether or not you're also going to have wraparound services and a little more teacher pay. So I actually think that you're, I was going to say, as someone who spends his life as a child advocate and who always talks, as you know, Randy, and you know, Linda, about kids in education, never about one or the other. It isn't this fundamentally, it goes to your stat, too. The fact that as a society, we really do have not valued, no matter how many improvements we've had, we don't really value, because it's always this choice versus that choice, but we're willing to spend one or two trillion on Iraq and Afghanistan, or we're willing to go spend whatever it's going to take now to, 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 to uh, uh, deal with ISIL. And, and, and when you look at the real national security of a society, you have to look where we spend the resources. Well or not, by the way, Checker, because obviously we can talk a lot about it. Wait, but to me, that's the fundamental dynamic here. And the choice that you posed, Rob, shows it's because we're always choosing this or that when it comes to kids in education as opposed to saying they ought to be our big party. So from that soapbox statement that you did not call for, but you got here, here, because I, I think it's so key. And I think it's so imp I, I also think sometimes when Checker or, or Randy will disagree about this or that, they both totally care about education and kids. They've spent 40 years both working in this area. He's they younger. OK, thank you. Well, that's sort of, I would agree on that statement, actually. <laughs> but I think that's a really big point. Even when you see the I'm people I'm not sure who after tonight. 
<laughs> but I think that's such an important point when you went for the frame that you all have in this, in this debate. It's because we're always fighting between this or, the, and this or that with kids in education, but saying we need all of that, and we need to stop focusing on this stuff over here. So my, that now, flipping to you, David, on this. What was your reaction to someone who's probably written it, had more history textbooks <laughs> read by anybody uh, in the country when they did this in Jefferson County, Colorado, and, 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 and you saw the, mo the movement to, to, to change history texts? I'd be interested in what you all, great educators, think of that as well. I'm not sure we have time to do this justice. Uh, <laughs> because it's a little bit of a complicated narrative. But the, the background is that the uh, Advanced Placement U.S. History exam, which has gone from maybe 70 or 80,000 takers uh, 25 years ago to almost 500,000 today, it's become a big program nationwide. Um, and a lot of teachers began complaining to the college board that the subject was just it expanded, the subject of American history, in the way they were expected to teach it in order to meet the standards of the AP U.S. History exam. The subject had just become too large. Be for the good reason that uh, university-based scholars, for the most part, have added whole dimensions to the field of American history in the last two or three generations, things that weren't taught to our parents or grandparents, like environmental history, women's history, and so on and so forth. Uh, and also, we've added a half century of time since the APOS <laughs> history <laughs> program began. We've added more history. <laughs> so so the, co the college board <laughs> undertook a project to uh, redimension the guidelines for teachers who are teaching this course is called a framework. Uh, and they simultaneously undertook to change the character of the exam that's eventually given <clears throat> in order to cultivate something other than just rote ingestation, memorization of facts, and more critical and analytical abilities, which is what, at the university level, what the teaching of history is, at its essence, all about. Um, this has, I suppose, predictably uh, produced a backlash in certain quarters. The Republican National Committee uh, met last summer and passed a formal resolution condemning this framework. The state of Texas uh, Board of Education has forbidden the framework to be implemented in Texas. And for some reason, Jefferson County, Colorado is the place that's got the most media attention about this in the last few weeks because a local school board has also tried to void this new framework. And students have taken to the streets, as it were, uh, to protest this because they think that any attempt to uh, uh, by the school board to uh, condemn this uh, new approach is indoctrination, and I uh, should be more concrete about this. All of the uh, criticism so far, or the most of the criticism aimed at this framework, is that it's insufficiently patriotic. Uh, things are called out by some of the critics that it never mentions the heroism of D-Day and doesn't mention Benjamin Franklin and so on. Uh, and that it has a negative view of American history. The fact is it's a framework, not a curriculum. That's a technical difference, but one that counts. And the expectation of those who drafted this document was that, uh, of course, teachers are going to teach D-Day and Benjamin Franklin. I mean, who wouldn't if you're teaching a course in American history? But that didn't need to be called out as a particular item, but that's got a lot of people uh, quite upset. That's the history. And the panel's take on this in terms of what it says about anything really important for us to take, or is it a blip in time? I'm going to let Checker take I've the I've looked lead. at the framework and the sample test, and I think they need some repairs. I actually do, uh, as, as somebody who once upon a time took an AP U.S. history test. Uh, I think that a lot of the criticism is, is, is goofy and hysterical, but I also think the College Board has done the right thing by saying they're going to they're gonna take another look at it. I, th I think the issue, from what I heard from the s teachers and the students um, in Jeffco, is that they didn't, what they really didn't like was that the um, school board um, wanted them to learn a particular sect of economics, that private enterprise was more important than any other economic system, and that's what ultimately triggered the, um, the response. But what I think is pretty remarkable is this is students actually taking control. Think about the engagement here. This is students taking control of their education and saying that this is really important enough to them and what their lives are going to be that they engaged in this kind of civil protest. And frankly, I thought that was pretty cool. Linda, well, Linda one last, let's get, let's. I just want to underscore the fact that around the country and around the world, students are marching around education. 
I feel like we're coming back around to the era of the 60s and 70s where students are saying what's needed. In Chile, for example, which privatized its system and created a very inequitable system, two and a half million students took the streets and brought the whole system down for a number of years. We've seen students marching in Spain and England and in Philadelphia and so exactly. on. So I think this is the era where education is going to get fixed by the people who have the most at stake, um, who are going to demand a much more thoughtful, a much more equitable education system. That's a what a good note to end on. on. Please join me in thanking our guests. <laughs> next week, it didn't come up today, but I'm sure it will next week, uh, the issue of technology within education, especially something of concern for people here. But we have Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, as well as Janet Mathpolitano, the head of the UC system in California, to talk about technology and social change, in which I'm certain the topic of technology and education will arise. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.